Okay. Hello and welcome everyone to our panel, how to deliver the full potential growth value creation outcomes. My name is Ralph Hirt and I'm the CEO There are approximately 500 private unicorns globally. However, according to PE Pitchbook in the last five years, there were more than 200,000 investment deals done at a total of more than $1 trillion. As a result, some companies are doing extremely well, while the vast majority do not really deliver the full potential. I'm extremely delighted to have some fantastic panelists here today who have seen it all. We have here with us, Renita Karlholm, Forbes contributor, leadership coach, including Navy SEALs. Chris Cunningham, founding partner, C2 Ventures, and also podcast host of Superpowers and much more. Ryan Dene, founder and CEO Electric, New York's top growth company, two previous exits to public companies. And he's also super engaged on uh, Twitter. Michael Rubenstein, a former president of Nexus, acquired by AT&T and former GM at Google and DoubleClick. He has seen it all in EdTech. And uh, Naveen will be able to join us as well. Naveen Tukaram, investor, entrepreneur with 3 billion in exits and has served on seven boards of directors. His podcast is Unpacking Impact and his first guest was Silicon Valley icon Peter Thiel. So we don't have uh, Renita here yet. I think she's still uh, trying to uh, dial in. Hopefully she will be in uh, in a couple of minutes. So uh, how about we start uh, with Chris? Chris, after spending some years in tech and mobile, you set up your own VC firm and invest in startups. We would love to learn a bit more about your journey. Yeah, hi guys. Nice to be with you and uh, thanks for having me. So. Um, Chris Cunningham, 20 years in media and tech out of New York City as a founder and operator. Um, in 2014, I started doing angel investing um, half time, then into full time to, to really help founders in kind of their journey in the first couple of years. Um, and then took that angel portfolio and launched a uh, $10 million early stage venture fund out of New York. So right in 250 to a half a million dollar uh, ticket size from um, first check and then fall on investment. So we've made 18 investments out of fund one. Um, we're backed by 60 uh, notable um, LPs, founders and operators, like some of the uh, panelists that are on the call. And now we turn our attention to fund two, which is a $50 million target. So um, really trying to work collaboratively with early stage founders. Um, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. And yeah, on the side, I do a podcast called, uh, superpowers where we uncover people's superpower. So thanks for having me. Okay, great. Uh, Renita and Naveen have joined as well. Can you guys hear us? Yes, Ralph. Good to see you. Hey, Naveen. Great to see you. Renita, you as well? Not yet. So uh, maybe uh, Ryan. Um, so you're CEO of uh, Electric, one of the fastest or maybe the fastest growing tech company here in New York. You had uh, very successful um, investment rounds in the last uh, six months, I believe it's like 70 million. Uh, really exciting to be having you here. Maybe you can share a little bit about your journey and the, your background. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, depending on who I'm talking to, I'm a, I'm a reformed ad tech guy. Uh, so I, my, my first business was a, was a vertical ad network that, that I started back in, uh, uh, in 2008 uh, when I was in college. Uh, we sold ads on extreme sports websites. So that was about as big of a business as it probably sounds like. Um, <laughs> but, we, uh, but, you know, we were, we were, you know, we didn't raise much money. Um, timing was right. And uh, so actually in the beginning, um, right before the economy crashed, actually, we, we had a successful, small but successful exit to USA Today Sports. Um, so did that for about four years and then um, started my first software company. It was a retail analytics business uh, called Swarm. And uh, hey, did I lose you guys? Yeah, we can hear you. I think we lost him. 
You might have lost him. All right. Um, let's hope uh, he will be able uh, to dial in again. Uh, Michael, uh, we've known each other for, I guess, uh, two decades. At Tech Years uh, passed quickly. Wow. Um, it's probably the most, uh, one of the most volatile and uh, largest tech value creation uh, verticals. Tell us a bit more. Was it easy? Uh, uh, definitely not easy, but, uh, you know, Ralph, first of all, thank you for having me. And it's great to see all the panelists today. Um, yeah, I mean, ad technology has been at the heart of the development of the commercial Internet for 20 years now. I mean, if you think about it, the primary monetization models online are, um, you know, advertising and monetization of attention, uh, e-commerce and uh, subscriptions. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, it's been really, really interesting to see the evolution of marketing and advertising online um, from a, 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 you know, kind of a niche thing to obviously today the, the dominant Uh, channel for um, advertising overall and, and still a lot of growth ahead. Um, so, you know, for me, my journey started at DoubleClick, which was, you know, an early pioneer in digital advertising and marketing, and certainly one of the earliest um, scaled internet companies in New York. And it was a great place to learn. And then after we sold that business to Google, um, I stayed at Google for a couple of years and moved on to um, entrepreneurship yet again with AppNexus, which was a next generation advertising technology company and spent a decade building that and eventually sold it to AT&T. And it's the foundation of AT&T's advertising business today. And uh, yeah, it's been incredibly competitive and uh, dynamic uh, and exciting as a sector. And it's given me a great window into the development of the internet overall. Okay, awesome. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, Naveen, I introduced you uh, earlier already. Um, investor, entrepreneur with three billion in access and have done the seven boards of directors. And you also have the podcast Unpacking Impact with your first guest uh, being Peter Thiel, uh, Silicon Valley icon. Uh, maybe you can share a bit about uh, your impressive background and the many things that you are doing. Sure, Ralph. Great to see you. I think we've known each other not 20 years, but way too long. But not too long at the same time. Not too long at the same time. I think That's 2011 right. or 10 or something. Right. Um, anyway, great to see everybody. Um, hope to connect with all of you all. So I'm Naveen. I, I'm, I'm, if, if other people are reformed ad tech guys, I've been, um, I'm a reformed private equity guy. I started my career on Wall Street, and then I was a partner at Paul Allen's investment fund, Vulcan Capital, um, until sort of uh, through the financial crisis and then started Uh, investing in tech companies. And Ralph and I met through this experience with a company called Quickie, which uh, we won TechCrunch Disrupt back in 2011, which is pretty much in history in the tech world. Um, and then we actually the business to Yahoo uh, in a nice situation. So and then I started um, investing in a lot more tech companies. And what I'll probably talk about today later is my investment in a company called Skykick, which is a cloud software platform which uh, I've been an investor almost since day one, which has scaled from uh, zero people, zero revenues, zero customers to over 25,000 B2B customers in 100 countries uh, providing cloud automation services to IT service providers, which sounds very nerdy, but is extremely important. So that's me, Ralph. And yes, my, my podcast, we were fortunate to have Peter Thiel as the first guest and David McCormick, the CEO of Bridgewater Associates as our second guest. So that's uh a fun little project trying to do a lot of what people are doing here, which is trying to uh, just educate each other on some of these very important trends through the eyes of some of the most accomplished people that you could imagine. So Ralph, thanks for having me. thousand plus uh, leaders, including uh, future Navy SEALs for Correct. a long time. Uh, maybe you can tell us a bit more about yourself and what do you see as the key competency or mindset we'll need to maximize uh, value creation? Yeah, thanks, Ralph. I'm glad to be here, especially since I had a little difficulty getting in. But um, I think we're just living in such an exciting time 
And I know it's been unsettling as the world becomes more VUCA and volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. But at the same time, I think VUCA offers so much opportunity for exponential value creation. So if before we were driving down sort of a well-marked highway, I think now we're going off-road and there's just going to be many more unexpected detours. So I think to stay in the race, uh, leaders, in order to capture the value or the opportunities for value creation, they're going to have to develop many more new competencies, become much more adaptable, dramatically expand their range. And this is what I help my clients, tech founders in the military, do. And um, I think we're going to have to be more like one of my clients in the special forces who told me, you know, one day we're kicking down doors and the next day we're in a meeting negotiating resources. So the business equivalent, equivalent of that is one hour you're analyzing user data to determine what product feature to, to do next. And the next hour, you know, you might be in the bathroom consoling a team member who's going through a conflict. So um, I see that as the ability to calibrate and oscillate between being decisive and quick to execute and being comfortable with ambiguity and going into the unknown, because I think we're going to have a, a lot more wicked problems that are ongoing and they don't have a, an, a one and done solution. So um, I think we can all feel the pace of change is accelerating. And if you hit a, tra a tree going 100 miles per hour, it's going to be a much bigger problem than if you hit a tree going 50 miles per hour. So um, there's this paradox in maximizing value creation that I wanted just to share before we uh, dive in deeper. But that is to we're going to have to learn how to slow down to speed up. Um, we're going to have to slow down to build in redundancies and plan for what Michelle Bucher calls the gray rhinos, those highly probable, high impact events like a global pandemic. Uh, and typically leaders aren't rewarded or recognized for taking preemptive action. But um, being able to respond to a crisis means that instead of panicking, you can stay calm and really identify those opportunities and take advantage of them. I think we're going to have to slow down to communicate clearly to embrace the conflict that comes from diversity and connect more deeply with people, not just treat them like efficiency machines. And we're going to have to slow down and reflect and debrief and look back and unpack our mistakes because those mistakes can become uh, intellectual property. Uh, and so you and I, Ralph, have talked about this, how most people extract less than 5% of the learning from their experience, they just want to keep moving, you know, and go on to the next experience instead of taking the learning each day, building on it, building that compounding element um, so that they can really find the, find the value. So I think the good news is that we're all sitting on a pile of gold and we just need to develop the skills to identify, to discern where the value is in the value chain. And we really need to just evolve and ex expand our range. And uh, that's that's my mission in, in working with my clients. I think that's a very exciting uh, mission. Do you have a, a framework and, and tools uh, that you provide? I do with have your frameworks clients? and tools. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I have a, a, a framework called "How to Develop a, a Mental Six Pack," so you can override your bio, your neurobiology, and really, you know, get out of survival mode, which I think a lot of us are in a lot of the time. I think Naveen uh, liked to hear this. He's very uh, much into, I guess, um, exercising and mental fitness as well. Uh, can, can you resonate uh, to what Renita said and apply this for the businesses you've been involved in? Yeah, I was doing some um, pull-ups yesterday and some leg lifts, and I was working on my actual six-pack, and I was working on the wrong <laughs> six-pack, it turns out. So we'll have to update my... Uh, my operating system here. You can do yeah, that. no, I love what, everything you said about that in terms of, you know, I, I think applying some of the Silicon Valley mindsets, I know that you're, you've taken it to a greater level in terms of flexible thinking to global businesses, to much larger businesses, because you find as organizations scale, and I know this is a topic of the conversation today, or one of them, is that they lose their flexibility. Mm -hmm. They lose their flexibility. And one of my passion projects has been something called Innovation Boot Camp, which has taken many forms, but I've been lucky enough to work with at companies like Google, uh, Microsoft, did a thing for Facebook, Deutsche Bank. And you see, even those are all large companies, right? The range, I mean, obviously Google, Facebook, very innovative. Whereas let's just say Deutsche Bank was not quite as innovative as the other two, which is probably why I was there, right? So it's like the when you scale, being able to maintain that, I call it, 
innovation mindset is so, so important. But like you talked about, a lot of it is learning. And by the way, Ralph, to your point about my you know personal interest in this, I'm I'm firing up my ice bath later today to get oh. the mind a little a little stronger. I think I've been uh, only operating at you know seven out of ten. So is that being broadcasted as well? I'll probably uh, put it on my Instagram. All right, cool. So follow Naveen on Instagram. Uh, new, um, I guess, findings all the time. Uh, M Michael, so you have been, I guess, you know, with uh, AppNexus and DoubleClick Google through, I guess, many areas of change from, I guess, you know, exits uh, going private, many acquisitions on uh, both sides. How do you navigate through and how have you navigating your teams through all these changes? Mm. Well, I think one thing is, um, you know, you have to be in the mentality. And I think it's important for the team to be in the mentality that change is the constant. Um, stability is not generally the constant in these ventures. And, and I oftentimes find people walk into companies with this feeling of resistance where they're kind of craving stability and it's, it's hard mm. to let go of that. And I think that, um, that's, that's, it's difficult to be in, you know, a dynamic internet sector, you know, if that's what you're, what you're expecting. Like, I think, um, it's going to be much more fun and the business will be much better uh, positioned to capitalize if everyone is in, the mentality that, you know, change is going to be the norm. And not only that, um, as Renita was saying as well, that um, it creates opportunity and, uh, and we can capitalize on that. And so I think, um, you know, the world of digital advertising and marketing has evolved tremendously over the last 20 years, but um, there have consistently been amazing opportunities presented, right? The shift from desk desktop computers, pardon me, to laptops and mm -hmm. mobile devices and tablets, connected television devices, um, you know, like just so many new consumer mediums, social media, um, email, you know, Twitter, you know, everything. And, you know, consumers are not going to slow down. And so I think these opportunities for innovating using marketing will continue to proliferate as well. And so I think the most important thing I've found to go back to your question really is try to help get everyone into that mentality of, you know, we're going to be in this dynamic environment. We're going to communicate um, and we're going to try and have our eyes open about, you know, what we're working on and if we're evolving, you know, Of, I guess, technology changing all the time and all these opportunities by at the same time, I guess, executing strategies and, you know, make sure that people are focusing on the right thing. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the cool things that I've been exposed to a lot over the years has been entrepreneurship as well as entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, Back when I did like double click ad exchange, for example, Ralph, which you were at double click with me about, where we basically created a new company within the company that ended up being significantly bigger than the original company that birthed it. Um, that's a that's a hard thing to do, and it's something that a lot of companies don't succeed at, and they end up just getting disrupted by you know venture back startups or or what have you. And um, yeah, I think that. Um, Part of the uh, secret has been identifying what's coming and dedicating what I usually think of as like tiger teams or innovation teams um, and giving them sufficient autonomy to go address the new opportunities and recognize that those opportunities also are going to take time to develop and evolve. And I think that that model can work and be really effective for existing companies. And, you know, it's a little bit of a myth that, like, big companies can't innovate. We, we sort of think that, like, oh, you know, so it's such, such a big company, they can't innovate. But then you look at companies like Amazon, 
who have been successfully innovating for 20 years. And I think it, um, it is really possible, um, but you need to, you know, kind of align your organization the right way and, and put right, the right people in the right places. Yeah, now that uh, sounds uh, great. And, and I think we will get uh, back to uh, innovation uh, in, in a bit because it's just such a big uh, subject. Uh, Chris, uh, you've been uh, investing in the various uh, tech companies over the uh, last uh, couple of years. Uh, what, what's your sort of a selection process? And, you know, before you make an investment, do you look into sort of aspects of compound value creation and strategy execution? And how do you approach this? Yeah, so quickly, my, my the, the, the heels of C2B and starting a fund was basically as a, I've been a founder operator, started a company called App Savvy, made some good decisions. And probably around the time I met Michael too was, was back then. I think we had App Savvy before App Nexus, even though his company yeah. was like a couple of billion <laughs> more than mine. Um, so, um, but you know, same the, range. Yeah, but the insight of that was, um, you know, I felt coming out of my experience that I've done a lot of things right, late twenties, early thirties, but I made a lot of mistakes. And as you get older, I think you can come to grips to to not sort of crushing it, which we're all sort of inclined to say that we do to each other. So when I started doing angel investing, it really was to help founders um, kind of know where the bodies were buried and, and where the icebergs are and to, to help them fundraise and, and uh, to, to open up doors commercially. And you would think that the venture model did that today. It doesn't. Um, and you would think that maybe there would be some insight on how to deal with a challenging board member or when to pivot or not to jam product market fit. So all these things that I experienced, I'm like, where, where were my people to kind of help me navigate this, these challenges, because I think I would have had better outcomes. Um, so I did it with purpose, wasn't curing cancer, but felt good to support founders. With our, with our portfolio today, the way we scale it is through our LPs. So our LPs get involved with diligence on things like machine learning, AI, you know, above my pay grade, to be honest. I'm good at three things and other things, happy to sort of have other people support post-investment. So We're very high touch. We're very collaborative, which is not sort of traditional venture. And, um, you know, so the, the point of that is when we, um, as far as identifying and working with founders, outside of having a, a, um, a, a the right balance and a kind of highly technical uh, in, group of individuals, what we're most excited about, to be honest, even though most people know me as 20 years as ad tech and media, we don't invest in that category <laughs> um, uh, at all. We, we We invest in boring things like, Uh, bathroom cleaning and data around trucking insurance and revenue management for airlines. So, you know, very mundane, I guess, from the outside, potentially a boring industry, but they represent billions of dollars of market share and spend. And there's, they're ripe for innovation. Um, there's been stagnant productivity growth, lack of software. So where we've kind of honed in working with founders and our, and our LPs is sort of identifying um, industries that have billions of dollars of market share and spend, unquestionable, but highly questionable or lack thereof software, enterprise uh, software. So, you know, that's a little bit of kind of where we focus and kind of how we how we think. We've been told over the last two years that we definitely um, um, have this uh, execute quite well in regards to um, um, supporting founders in a very deep way before their Series A. We, we are a pre-seed seed. We, our first check would never be a Series A. So, you know, I believe uh, the, that those first three years are kind of the most critical uh, as far as not running out of money and um, sort of making mistakes that a lot of us have made before. So th that's kind of our flywheel. Um, and um, so far, so good. So, of course, your investment companies, they will all grow amazingly. But if there was one that wouldn't, what, what do you think is sort of typically the, the issue? Because often companies really don't deliver the full potential as we know. And, you know, so many start and have this, you know, unicorn or more idea, and then sometimes they just plateau. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, certainly there, there are things, it's interesting in regards to COVID, I feel like we have to talk about it. It's so strange to see so many companies propel um, and leverage the tailwind, which is really hard to, I think, digest because the last year has been so challenging. And then I know, you know, not luckily from our portfolio, but certainly my angel portfolio, two companies went out of business strictly because of COVID, because they were in retail or they were in gyms or whatnot. 
Um, but I think, you know, I, you know, certainly I think the get into a point where you can be self-sustainable. So to answer your question, I think, you know, the companies that may not work um, are the ones that grow um, too quickly, um, raise too much money. I think we, I think we celebrate the term unicorns too much. I hate that term. I, I think we celebrate fundraising too much. Um, but I, I, so I, I think ones that sort of grow steady and understand that it's the venture is really just a catalyst to sort of, get off the ground and validate proof of concept, right? And get your product going. But ultimately uh, the companies that I think have longevity are the ones that are able to build a self-sustain that has a real business. And the last comment, Matt's, Matt, my partner is not on. He's my secret weapon, 20 years, I guess similar, um, similar to one of the panelists, you know, 20 years, a uh, hedge fund, Carlisle group, you know, um, classic CFO. Um, he, you know, so the, the business, the economics around the business not founders, not chasing things because some fancy names in it, but really what does a strong financial business look like over a two, two, year, two, three year plan? We can very much remove a lot of companies out of our conversation that don't, that, that don't have that. So um, yeah, but I think the answer to your question is um, not sort of thinking about uh, getting to a point of independence or break even in a thoughtful way. Though That's probably the one that doesn't pan out. Yeah, yeah. Um, Renita, during, I guess, crisis and uh, COVID, Chris just brought it up. Was there like a extra run for kind of coaching services where you mm. extra business that many people, I guess, struggle with handling this, I guess, surprise situation? Yeah. Yeah, I think there was. I think even before the pandemic, people were already in survival mode, you know, on the brink of burnout. And there was just no cushion. They just had no reserves in terms of energy. And so when a pandemic comes, I mean, I think very um, both at a personal health, mental level, and also just organizational level, a lot of people are, are often operating at the brink without that cushion. So I think a lot of people realized, oh, I can't do this on my own. I really do need some support, someone to help me develop this discipline to do the things I need to do to help me create those systems Uh, because I otherwise I'm just going to go off, you know, they, they need some guardrails, basically, I think. And that just I think you mentioned discipline is going to be so much more important now than ever, because, like I said, we're going so fast that even the slightest uh, uh, mistake or wrong turn that's unnecessary can, can take you much farther off track. And now you're crawling back to the, the starting line and you're falling farther and farther behind in the race. Yeah, um, that also get back to the, I guess, innovation uh, aspect. Um, last month on Horasis, uh, we released the compound value creation quotient and CoFQ insights report. And uh, one thing was clear in particular what growth companies are concerned. They are struggling with uh, innovation management. Partly mm -hmm. it actually even doesn't exist. Uh, it's just like an idea somehow, you know, that's been, I guess, owned by someone for some time until something else comes up. And uh, even so, also some larger companies, you know, find it difficult to be innovative. Obviously, Michael managed uh, Amazon or so, yeah, but it's maybe the exception if you look into all industries. Naveen, you run the innovation boot camp, and I was actually lucky to participate uh, in it. Um, maybe you can share some uh, findings and the key things that you address. Sure. I mean, I think that just to make it broad, I think whether it's a small company or a big company, they have to be very, very conscious and committed to innovation, right? Because we, we talk about the joke is like uh, most people want to take an innovation vacation, right? They want to do it. Everyone gets excited, especially big companies. Um, you know, they want to, yes. they just want to like have some good stuff. They want to like play some foosball and do all that good stuff and feel like they're a startup. They get like an external space that has like red and blue chairs and they're like, oh, we're innovative now, you know, as opposed to really committing to it at the highest level. It's usually seen as something, you know, fun to do for their team. 
And it's primarily not innovation. It's primarily, as you know, Ralph, it's like ideation, right? What new ideas can we throw out? Like what fun things can we, let's have some fun speakers. Let's have Naveen speak about Quickie or whatever, right? But really you need to have internal experts and teams on innovation, right? You need to have your scrum. You need to have all those things that we do at the companies on, you know, on this panel at the larger companies. But I, I think what ends up happening at big companies is that because that stuff doesn't move the needle quarter to quarter in the first couple of mm. years, they kind of don't commit to like at least a three year journey on it. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's innovation is not rocket science, but figuring out why big companies don't do it well is definitely not rocket science. It's all the basic stuff, right? It's politics. It's short term thinking. It's lack of commitment. It's lack of, you know, frankly, lack of know how because the people that survive those big companies are usually not people that are having sharp elbows trying to make change, right? It's people that fit into a certain system. And by definition, big companies have been around for more than a couple of years, right? I mean, Amazon is a, is a very long term tech company, but large, most large companies don't grow from zero to a trillion in 20 years. It takes, well, it never happens, but they've been around a lot longer. So those six systems and structures have also been a lot around a lot longer. So how do you change those things? It's much, much harder and no one is incentivized to do so, right? Your bonus is not going up because you, uh, you know, made your boss look bad because you're, you know, you changed the system. It's the opposite. So I think that for all those reasons, that's why most big companies um, or even, you know, medium, medium companies, I guess you want to use old economy, you want to use big, whatever word you want to use. Companies that are today not innovative, the reason why, even though they want to be, those are some of the reasons why they don't make that transition, Ralph. Are you applying Scrum methodology for innovation? Did I hear that? Well, I don't get that deeply involved in, from that perspective. It's more from an innovation mindset perspective. To be honest, lately I've been, you know, working for big companies was not a good way to use a passion project. Let's just put it that. So instead I've, I've pivoted a little bit and said no to those things lately because of some of the things we talked about. And I've been helping And I, by the way, I just want to say I love what Chris said about how he's helping his startups, because I think startups and founders do all make the same mistakes in the first three years. And, you know, it's a binary game. Either you win or you lose at that level. So having mm -hmm. someone that actually has their back at that point is very rare, especially in early stage VC, unfortunately, as we know. Um, but I've, I've created a program to help startups fundraise, but it's not for any of the startups that you or I know on the phone, it's for the ones in Kansas City and in Tennessee and in, you know, Canada that have no access to panels like this, people like this. They don't go to the same things. They don't go to the same cocktail parties. They're not in New York. They're not in Silicon Valley and helping them basically not get screwed over in their fundraising process. Um, and again, that's not rocket science, but unlike, unlike people on this panel, they haven't seen 10,000 pitches from an investor's perspective. So they're not going to recognize the same pattern. So Chris, doing a little bit what you're doing with them to make yeah, sure no. that they pass that first stage. I'm just going to piggyback on that just because it's relevant. I mean, and that's that's amazing work that you're uh, that you're doing. That one quick comment: if I think if you just Google this, it's like 85, 90% of startups fail. But when you look at the data, as I mentioned earlier, the, the mistakes are being repeated continuously. Mm -hmm. As far as your comment about those underserved markets, it's funny, you know, we're focused on east of the Mississippi, but, you know, Chicago, Toronto, we're talking to a company in Alabama. One thing I just want to call out is the importance today, in particular in this environment, that our networks, we're lucky, a lot of us on the call are lucky enough to have networks that expose us and give us access. I, two of our companies we invested in, one was a LinkedIn message. This was somatic, a YC robotic bathroom cleaning company. 95% of what I see on LinkedIn spam, you know, a lot of spam on email. But I do think it's important to call out and encourage each of us to try to comb through that. To your point, Naveen, it's not, if you're in Kansas City, it's not their fault that they can't go to coffee shops and hop on airplanes. So therefore, they may have a great, a brilliant idea and they could be the great, greatest team, but they have to cold, cold call you. They have to email you. And we have to not look at all those inbounds as a as sort of a, a negative or turn our nose up to it because we don't know them because there, there are diamonds in the rough. And if they do their research, I mean, I've been blown away by people that they know more about me than I know about myself. And they found <laughs> they, 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 they've, they've done their research and those emails deserve a proper 
response in a call, regardless of your kind of your degree of connection. So I just want to wanted to piggyback on that on that point that you made. Yeah, I, I love that, Chris. But, I, you know, I don't think most folks are are as sort of forward thinking as you, unfortunately, from a investor perspective, especially when they're getting so many emails. And, and you make, make a great point about when you said they researched me and knew me better than, you know, my best friend or whatever. Because I spoke on, um, I, I gave a just a workshop, you know, just for fun for uh, 50 or 100 entrepreneurs yesterday in Utah. And I brought up that point, which is that I def- definitely recommend don't cold email. But if you do, research your oh, yeah. target. Because most people actually don't, unfortunately. Like that one basic thing, even on, you know, when you looked on, we all probably have 400 LinkedIn requests, right? But the only like 10% of them have that little personal note, as easy as that is to do. Um, yeah. Just that basic... Again, not rocket science, but if you teach people it, they can enhance their, um, you know, efficiency and effectiveness. You, you should write a seminar and it'd be kind of fun and humorous. And I could help um, like almost like the top 10 things of not what what not to say on your open and LinkedIn line. Um, <laughs> we, should, we, should, we should collaborate on that. That'd be yeah, fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> OK, uh, Michael on the. Uh, oh, maybe the. Michael? Or, I'm with yeah. you. Yep, I'm uh, here. Okay. I, I just wanted to sort of go back to sort of, you know, to kind of the strategy framework. And uh, I guess sort of a double click on Google, you know, we had a, a very nice uh, approach. Um, I'm sure, you know, you, uh, I guess, use some of it at uh, at Nexus as well. But uh, how, how do you make it part of, I guess, the, the culture and that people really live it so that the execution is actually done on an ongoing basis successfully? Yeah, that's a great question. And as you know, like in DoubleClick, like we really, that, that we did it the same way at AppNexus, but it, it came in a lot of ways from the experience I had at DoubleClick and I saw how impactful it was on the business. And, you know, what we did was basically set like two days a month aside for strategy. Um, and not just strategy formulation. I mean, it, it kind of depends on like where you are in the year, because obviously if you're in the process of creating a new plan, you need to spend more of your time doing that. But um, yeah, I mean, to me, setting two days aside a month and always being inclusive in terms of like bringing leaders from across the company into the process really it became something that had like real cachet, like people really wanted to be a part of these sort of strategy discussions because they recognized that it was a chance for them to put their fingerprints on the business. And so um, now, of course, if you're just like in these closed doors meetings and then you don't share what's coming out of them with the company, then people will feel disenfranchised. And so I think that's the other side of it is not just committing to it and being inclusive, but also then being transparent with the rest of the company um, in terms of like what plans you're developing and why. Um, And I think that generally gives people a sense that they're connected to what's happening in the business and the reason for it Mm -hmm. and helps to, you know, going back to what I was saying earlier, like helps to manage in an agile way. So yeah, I'm a big fan of strategy, not necessarily like, hey, three-year, five-year strategy. I mean, sometimes strategy is even about, you know, how do we adjust uh, because the big big bet that we were making this year isn't working out. You know, we're not seeing the results we thought we were going to see, and so we need to be agile. But to me, setting aside time for that and being inclusive and transparent has been the key. Okay, yeah, great. Uh, Renita, I, I think that of, I guess strategy and leadership skills and uh, um, I guess cohesive framework is this mm-hmm. is what's been needed and where there's a lot of work that needs to be done in many organizations, especially growth organizations. Absolutely. I really like what you said uh, about the transparency and how you have people from every function involved in the strategy because I I think, you know, in some large companies, there's just that strategy team that goes into their, you know, little cave and comes up with a strategy for the next year. And just imagine in 2019, you know, they spent all this time coming up with a strategy for 2020 and then it all went to pieces. So I'm exploring this idea now of the team as strategy because they're the one out in the field. They're the one seeing all the changes. 
Um, you know, this is kind of how it works in the military. The general comes up with the basic goals, but then the SEAL teams, the Green Berets, they go out and they come up with a strategy of how to accomplish it. You don't have the generals trying to, to micromanage how they do that. So I think companies are going to start to emulate that model more and more because things are going to be changing just so fast. By the time you, you know, try to communicate back to the upper echelons, there's going to be a lot of opportunity and uh, opportunities lost and mistakes made and et cetera. Okay, that's uh, awesome. So um, we are actually coming already to the end of our uh, session here. Uh, maybe it just, uh, I guess there are many uh, key takeaways, but uh, just a few that I uh, noticed. Um, slow is the new plaque to grow fast, I guess. Uh, you need also a mental six pack. I guess every company is uh, really different. Uh, it takes a lot of uh, discipline. Uh, many growth companies actually make the same or similar mistakes mm. and a framework is needed that's also really inclusive and that gets full uh, buy-in. Okay, uh, thank you very much, um, uh, all the panelists. I think it was a great session and thank you very much for the audience for joining in. I wish you all a great Horasis conference. There are many interesting panels coming up. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Ralph. Thank Thanks, you, Ralph. everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.